Welcome to the One Community Off-Grid Water Heating Analysis Presentation. Given that over 50% of general power usage is consumed by the heating and moving of fluids, that almost 70% of our calculated needed energy will be used for this purpose, and that the power demands for remote community construction is so tight, it behooves us to make very certain that we are using the most efficient systems to heat our water. That's what this presentation is about, and our regularly updated webpage contains more details. In the case of one community, these systems will be used not only for showering and personal use, but also heating of the duplicable city center through the radiant flooring system. We'll begin our comparison process by evaluating the different ways to heat water using the same criteria. This is what we call an apples to apples approach, and it is, in our opinion, essential to help cut through biased marketing and other non objective information used to sell water heating related products. There are several different types of water heaters. Some are standalone systems and some can be used in conjunction with others. The tankless type, also called instantaneous water heaters, are very small and use electrical or gas energy to heat up water as it flows through the unit at a prescribed rate. Because it only heats up the water that is needed right before it is used, the efficiency is high, but the power, calculated as the amount of energy used as a function of time, is also high. The most common type of water heater is the tank type. Most households use this kind of water heater because of its low power draw. The tank type fills the tank with cold water and uses electrical or gas energy to heat the water to usable temperatures. In these water heaters, however, the heaters are not strong enough to heat the water as fast as it is used and the unit needs a recovery period after use. Also, the total energy used by this type ends up being more than the tankless because the water, while sitting in the tank, slowly loses heat to the surrounding environment. Most tanks are well insulated, but no insulation is perfect and some energy is always lost. The third type of heaters are heat pumps and they are definitely the trickiest to describe. The way a heat pump essentially functions is to borrow energy from somewhere else to heat the water. In some cases, the borrowed heat energy comes from cooling air with fans and radiators like an AC unit works in your home. Other times, the energy can come from cooling water with specialized heat exchangers. Heat pumps have efficiencies that appear greater than 100% because of the energy they are borrowing from the air or water they are chilling. For this reason, you can heat more water with much less energy. The downside is keeping the air or water coming into the unit at the ideal temperature when seasonal, or even daily, temperature changes occur. When combined with a geothermal loop, however, the inlet temperatures and therefore the heat pump's performance can be stabilized. Heat pumps can be used in a tank type or a tankless instantaneous setup. Though in most commercial tank type units, the variability in performance is buffered using a normal electrical heating element to make up the difference when the heat pump is not working at peak efficiency. The fourth type of water heating is solar water heating. It uses no electricity or gas and uses the absorption of solar radiation to heat water. Depending on the season, latitude, and weather, the output of heated water can vary dramatically. The function of these units is fairly simple. Water is moved to the top of an array of solar absorbing black pipes that heat up when exposed to the sun and thus heat the water. Water is then sometimes used directly in a tank or instantaneous unit or the water is used in a heat exchanger. The resulting efficiency is the combination of a normal tank or instantaneous unit with the added energy of heated water from the solar collector. Like the heat pump, the efficiencies can appear to be over 100% because the energy borrowed from the sun. Now let's explore measuring the effectiveness of these different systems. There are many ways in which devices that heat water can be measured. We chose to focus on the energy factor and efficiency, which is simply the energy output of the heated water compared to the amount of electrical energy the unit uses. In a perfect system, the amount of energy to heat the water would be the exact amount of energy the system absorbs. No system is perfect, however, so it should be understood that we will never make the system 100% effective. However, if some of the energy we use in the heating of the water comes from somewhere else, for instance, the cooling of air or water and or solar heat, the amount of electrical energy we must supply goes down and our energy factor goes up, often beyond 100%. With all this in mind, we begin looking at the total efficiencies of various systems and combinations of system. This meant taking into account the cost of the water heating units and the cost of the needed equipment to power it. Since an off-grid community like one community is not on the power grid, the cost of using power isn't as simple as looking at our power bill. More specifically, the cost of our power can be assumed to be nearly zero dollars after the necessary equipment is installed, which meant there was no use in evaluating the actual draw of the units, except to see how much it would cost to install the needed infrastructure to support each of the different systems. When we add these two costs together, we see the true cost of the system. 
Here's a graph comparing the different types of systems and their costs. The yellow is the variance due to solar heating, meaning the actual cost would be dependent on solar heat and will fall somewhere in the yellow range in the case of systems using solar. This graph shows how the different solutions compare with respect to their equipment costs, cost of the water heater, and the energy costs, the costs associated with buying the energy infrastructure to provide that system with energy. We calculated this assuming that we require roughly a set specific amount of money to buy the equipment to generate one kilowatt hour per day of electricity. This specific number was based on the cost of one kilowatt hour per day of photovoltaic energy produced for our location. Energy production could be much more efficient, however, and therefore less costly for other locations. So we also created this graph, which is exactly the same as the previous graph, but with the cost of implementing the energy infrastructure reduced by half. Again, the reason for this is to show the effect of reduced energy costs on the overall price of selecting a unit. What you can see here is that there was very little difference, meaning that the cost of the unit is a distant second in importance from the efficiency of that unit. This is because remote locations are paying up front for their complete energy infrastructure and then producing what is essentially free energy from that point forward. This slide contains a graph of a break-even analysis. Basically, the cost to implement the needed power is plotted across the bottom and the total cost of the unit is plotted vertically. What you see here is that the different units' lines have different slopes and start points, which represent the effect the energy cost has on their total cost and their equipment cost, respectively. What's interesting here is that many of the cheaper pieces of equipment become very expensive as the cost for developing the needed energy infrastructure increases. On the flip side, there are some options that cost quite a bit initially, but the total costs don't change as much as we move to the right on the graph. Where two units lines cross is the point where the two units are equal in cost. This is where the two units break even, and it is the threshold for determining which unit is truly more economical. So what were our conclusions? From this fairly simple analysis, it became very clear to us that with off-grid situations where initial energy infrastructure costs must be factored in too, the most efficient system will be the most economical system with very few exceptions. The more you're paying to build your energy infrastructure, the more it pays to invest up front in maximally efficient water heating infrastructure because the money spent up front saves directly on energy infrastructure costs and therefore pays for itself exponentially over a much shorter time than a person would expect in a traditional on-grid situation. It then falls to the engineers to design an extremely efficient system, which, as we saw before, are the systems that have the highest energy factor. So the more we utilize those systems, the better. And that is what we're open source creating. If you'd like to see the details, visit onecommunityglobal.org forward slash sustainable dash water dash heating. Thank you. And we hope this was helpful.